Thank you very much. So uh, thanks to uh, the organizer, thanks to Xi and Mihai for organizing this uh, beautiful conference. I'm very sorry that I cannot be in Marseille, but anyway, so it's already very nice to have a conference like this when you're locked down in Paris, um, even though locked down in a week sense. All right, so um, what I want to report on today is a recent result with uh, Maria Pia Gualdani, Cyril Imbert, and Alexis Vasseur on uh, partial regularity for the lambda equation with Coulomb interaction. And so this is going to appear in the Annals of École Normale Supérieure. All right, so, um, um, all right, so here is the um, space homogeneous uh, lambda equation <coughs> with unknown f, the distribution function, that's a function of time and velocity. So the space variable is uh, removed. So f t and v is a non-negative function, and the Landau equation, which is probably familiar to most people working on kinetic equations here, so recalled uh, for convenience, is d by dt of f equals to the divergence in v, uh, the integral of r3 of a of v minus w, grad v minus grad w uh, of f of tv, f of tw, dw, right? So you integrate uh, for W running through R3, and this equation is posed on the whole of R3. So here, A of Z is uh, proportional to the Hessian of the norm of Z, the Euclidean norm of Z. So in other words, if you compute what it is, so it's, if you put the, <coughs> the coefficient to be one over eight pi, so it's one over eight pi, the norm of Z times uh, pi of Z, where pi of Z is the orthogonal projection on the orthogonal of the line spanned by Z, okay? So if you, you can equivalently um, um, recast this equation in non-conservative form, in which case it reads D by DT of F or T and V equals to some diffusion matrix, which you obtain by taking the convolution in V of the matrix AIJ of Z uh, with F, so you take the convolution in V, and so this multiplies dvi dvj of f of tv and there is a, a term which is uh, precisely f of t and v squared the fact that here you have you have a purely local term is uh, characteristic to the uh, is characteristic of the coulomb interaction right so it's because when you take the second derivative of this um, you get the direct measure uh, at z, z equals zero right so uh, here it had a purely local term, which is f squared, and of course this is a dangerous term. So if you um, if you have here a constant diffusion matrix, this is a semi-linear heat equation. We know this blow up in finite time. But here, if if you know, of course this will promote blow up. But uh, if blow up builds up, I mean, if if, if uh, f increases, of course this will make the diffusion matrix increase as well. And you can hope that the diffusion ma matrix will offset the uh, effect of the f square terms here, right? So, um, in other words, you can hope for a balance between the f square term here and the diffusion term there, right? But nevertheless, there's an open question as to whether there is global existence of classical solutions or finite time blow up for the Cauchy problem <coughs> for the Landau equation set on R3. Good, so, um, um, however, um, in the late 1990s, uh, Cédric Villani came up with a good notion of uh, weak global solutions, defined therefore for all time, right? Uh, he called them uh, H solutions because the Boltzmann H theorem uh, plays a big role in the existence of the solution itself. So an H solution, in the terminology introduced by Cédric, there's a continuous function with values and distributions, right? So it's non-negative function. Already it's a measure, right? Um, and it's also L1 in time with values in the weighted space L1 minus one of R3. So uh, already L1 minus one of R3 uh, refers to this uh, family of weighted space, what I call um, LP uh, minus K or LPK, sorry, LPK, so function G is an LPK if uh, G uh, modulus to the P 
is integrable with the weight one plus v squared to the k over two, right? And you have this formula for the norm. So here, it means that you are integrable with the weight proportional to one uh, over one plus norm of v. Right, so it's, it's a function in this functional space, which satisfies conservation of uh, mass, momentum, and energy, uh, respect to the initial data, and uh, which satisfies um, the h uh, inequality, uh, the fact that the h function at time t is less than or equal to the h function initially, and um, the equation is satisfied in the following sense. The weak, formula, the weak formulation of the Landau equation is the integral of f in of v times phi of 0 and v dv, plus the integral from 0 to t of the integral in v of f times dt phi, is equal to this uh, term that involves um, uh, that involves the entropy uh, dissipation integrand that you find in the dissipation formula for the H function here. So here you have the integral from zero to T, the integral in V and W of the difference of capital Phi at V and at W, where capital Phi is the grad of little Phi, the test function, um, in a product with the projection on V minus W of the integral capital F grad V minus grad W of capital F, where capital F is the square root of uh, F of V, F of W, divided by V minus W, and there is a eight pi that is floating around, okay? Good, so um, this is the weak formulation of um, the, um, this is the weak formulation which Villani proposed to define global solutions to, uh, to the, the Landau equation. Good. Uh, nevertheless, um, uh, for the purpose of uh, proving <coughs> partial regularity, uh, we need more information on the solutions. But fortunately, with the same procedure by which Villani constructed global H solution, the same procedure, the same approximating scheme, will lead, will, will result, will produce uh, what we have called suitable solution by analogy with the paper by Kafferli, Kone, and Werk for partial regularity on Navier-Sos. Okay, so what is a suitable solution of um, the Landau equation? So <clears throat> it's a solution which satisfies the following truncated um, uh, entropy inequality. Namely, um, if I look at the relative entropy at the level kappa, which I define as H plus of G and kappa to be the integral of kappa times little h plus of G over kappa dV, where H plus is the function generating the H function. So it's Z log Z minus Z minus one, truncated, so truncated for Z um, uh, above one, right? So if you, so if you want, this is z log z minus z minus one times the indicator that z is larger than one. Okay. All right. So now h plus of f at time t two with respect to kappa plus some dissipation term uh, which involves some constant c prime e uh, integrated between t one and t two, the integral from t one to t two of the LQ norm of the grad V of F to the one over Q, where F is larger than kappa. So you take the L2 norm in time of this thing to the square dt, should be less than or equal to um, the truncated entropy at time T1. And there is an additional term, which is proportional to uh, kappa times the integral from T1 to T2 and the integral over all V of F minus kappa plus. Right. Okay. So um, if you take the approximation scheme uh, proposed by Villani uh, to construct H solutions and you pass to the limit and you <clears throat> uh, pay a little more attention to the properties of the sequence, then you arrive at this inequality, uh, which is satisfied for all uh, time in, um, on the half line, except possibly 
um, a negligible set of times, okay, uh, which is satisfied uh, for certain values of Q, which I'm going to explain in a minute, and with a certain um, dissipation constant, which I'm going to comment on in a minute also. All right, so, um, okay, uh, now, partial regularity in time has to do with the fact that you want to say that the set of times where the solution possibly becomes singular, it's no longer a classical solution, whatever you want to call it, uh, is going to be small in some sense. So here, uh, we call a regular time of F, a suitable solution on some interval of the half line. It's a time tau in that interval, right, such that F is in L infinity on the time interval tau minus epsilon tau for some epsilon, right, and for all these. Right? So here, we localize only in time, but this is global in velocity. So, um, all right, so this is the set of, this is singular times. So the set of singular times, in other words, the times which are not regular times uh, uh, in, in the interval i, uh, we denote by S of F i, okay? So now if you take a um, suitable solution to the Landau equation on some time interval, cross R3, uh, for all the uh, positive T, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I mean, on the half line cross uh, R3, uh, with some initial data F in, so the initial data uh, has a decay to any order uh, in V, right? So it has fast decay integrating in V. It has bounded um, initial uh, entropy, right? Then in that case, uh, you can prove that the Hausdorff dimension of the set of singular times for any suitable solution which has this F initial as initial data is at most one half. Okay. Um, all right, so let me, um, let me uh, say a few words. Let me explain um, how the proof uh, is organized. Um, okay, first, um, First, we need um, uh, an exist we need the global existence of such uh, suitable solutions. So as I said, the suitable solutions, they are constructed by using the same uh, approximation scheme uh, as was used by Cedric Villani to construct H solutions. And if you do that, uh, here's what you get. Uh, if you take any F in, which is uh, in L1, non-negative on R3, and um, which is integrable against the weight uh, norm of v to the k, which has finite entropy initially, then such an F initial um, will launch a suitable solution with, with that initial data uh, with a Q. So if you remember in the, in the definition of suitable solution, there is a there is a Lebesgue exponent in the dissipation here. So with some Q that is related to the decay in V of the initial data. So specifically, the Q which you observe in the dissipation term is related to the decay by this formula here. So Q is equal to 2K over K plus 3. And um, the constant C prime E that depends, that's the uh, dissipation constant in the suitable uh, solution inequality, uh, depends on capital T, depends on Q, and depends functionally on F initial. Um, okay? Right, and, okay, and there is always some negligible set of times which you don't care about, okay? Good, so, um, so this is the existence theory for uh, such uh, solutions, which, as I said, are constructed as the, by the same approximation scheme as was used by Villani for, for H solutions. Now, <clears throat> if you look at the, um, um, if you look at the, uh, the uh, entropy production term that comes from the Boltzmann H theorem, this is a non-local term, but there is a, rather recent and, and a very important observation, very important theorem by Devilet, which um, uh, 
allowed um, replacing this non-local dissipation uh, integrant uh, for the Boltzmann H theorem applied to the to the lambda equation by a purely local term. So here's the here's the Davila theorem. So if you take a function f, which is integrable and uh, has finite energy, right? So L12 means you can integrate uh, with respect to one plus v squared dv, right? And which has um, finite entropy, so f log f is in L1. Then if you look on the right hand side here, this quantity is exactly the entropy dissipation integrand which appears in the Landau equation when you do the Boltzmann H theorem. Well, the Devillette result is that up to some constant, which you can compute explicitly, this is bounded below by uh, the L2 norm of the gradient of square root of f with a weight in V, right? So this is a Fisher information, if you want, uh, with the weight of the order of v to the minus three, okay? And again, so the constant uh, cd that appears here uh, depends explicitly on the mass, momentum, energy, and entropy uh, of f, and therefore, uh, if you apply it, you know, this is an inequality which is true for all f, but um, you can apply it, of course, at each time on a solution uh, to, the, to the Landa equation. A corollary of this theorem uh, in the paper by Devillette, which appeared, I think, uh, five years ago, is that you have propagation of moments uh, for lambda. So if you assume that F initial is in L1K, so it has finite K finite moments with K larger than two, or for two, it's obvious, this is the conservation of energy. Then, uh, and, and if in addition, uh, uh, F in as a finite entropy, um, then, um, if f is an H solution with this f in as initial data, then f is going to be L infinity over finite time with values in L1k. So, in other words, you propagate k moments in finite time. Okay. So, maybe if you let t go to infinity, um, this is not going to be bounded in that space, but for finite time, you propagate k moments. Okay. Good. So um, with this, uh, let me look at the uh, truncated H theorem, uh, which is used um, in the definition of these uh, suitable uh, solutions to lambda. Right. So uh, you want to compute d by dt of the truncated entropy truncated at the level kappa. Of course, if you don't truncate, this is a standard H theorem. If you truncate at the level kappa, there is one piece that is dissipative, which I denote by D1, which involves essentially the same dissipation integrand as would appear uh, for the standard H theorem in the case of the lambda equation, except that here, instead of having uh, grad V of F over F minus grad W of F over F to the squared, I have the grad V localized where F is larger than kappa, and here I have the grad W localized where F is larger than kappa to the square, and integrating in all <coughs> variables. All right, so that's the dissipation term, and uh, this is the nice part um, of the equation, but of course, this truncation um, uh, gives rise to other terms, uh, which are not nice and which we put on the right hand side. Nevertheless, these terms, however not nice, can be computed explicitly. Uh, if you compute them, you find that you have um, something of the form minus the integral of A times the grad of Vf, where F is larger than kappa, times the grad in W of F, where F is less than kappa, right? Uh, you can integrate by parts uh, in V and W, and, and you let the derivatives bear on the collision kernel. Uh, if you do that, that will be uh, the integral of minus the divergence in V, the divergence in W of the tensor A of V minus W. 
Okay, so in fact, if you compute it, this is equal to the Dirac measure at V equals W. And here you have F of T V minus kappa plus times kappa minus F of T W minus kappa minus. All right, so in the approximation process, this is not going to be identically the Dirac measure, but this is at least going to be non-negative. So this extra term here is less than or equal to kappa, which comes from here, times the integral of f minus kappa plus. And now we find that if you want, this is a depleted nonlinearity. Uh, we call that depleted nonlinearity because if you return to the non-conservative non form of the lambda equation, which is written here, if you multiply both sides of the equation by log of f, and if you integrate, I mean, here you would observe something that grows like f squared log of f, which would be very bad. But nevertheless, uh, if you look at, if you do this computation here, the, the nonlinear term that comes from um, this uh, Dirac measure that appears when you take the double derivative of a, uh, it doesn't grow like f uh, squared log of f, it grows like f, it's, it's kappa, the integral of f minus kappa plus, which is tamed as a nonlinear IT compared to the compared to the entropy. So this is good news because this is going to help us controlling the equation. Unfortunately, not completely. That's why we have partial regularity and not full regularity. Okay. Good. So um, now, um, as I said, the sketch should prove proposition one, the existence proof. Well, I mean, you truncate, you replace a the collision kernel of Landau is a truncated variant. So in other words, you truncate one over Z at the level N, uh, right? You check that it satisfies this, uh, this inequality here. You use the Devilet theorem to uh, bound the dissipation plus the integral of F minus kappa plus below by the, this, um, <clears throat> um, this uh, Fisher information with the weight uh, proportional to the V to the minus three. And um, to remove the weight, you use the Devilet corollary. So in other words, the propagation of moments to uh, remove this decaying weight uh, at the expense of lowering the power that appears here. So by Hölder inequality, uh, you control this expression here below by the gradient with respect to V of F to the one of a Q, uh, where F is larger than, than kappa. And here, um, Q belongs to the, to the interval one, two. So Q is always less than two, right? And, um, and you have this older inequality here, and you enter that in the, um, <clears throat> in the truncated um, entropy inequality uh, here. And you get uh, you get the announced uh, inequality in the definition of the uh, of the suitable solution. Good. All right. So now we have suitable solutions. How is that going to help us proving uh, partial regularity? Well, this is done by the the Georgi uh, method. Uh, so the the Georgi method. I mean, actually, the the first part of the, the Georgi method, which consists in um, uh, gaining um, L infinity out of the energy or L2 bound. Okay. So here is how it works. So you take, uh, let F be a suitable solution to the lambda equation with some um, coercivity constant C prime E positive. And here I'm going to assume that Q is less than two, but at least six fifths. Right? You need something slightly uh, larger than one, and specifically you need six fifths. All right, so that's technical, doesn't matter. Uh, what is important is that Q should be free to approach two as much as possible. What is interesting is when Q is, a, is very near two. Okay. Well, uh, so for such an F, then there exists an eta naught, which depends on Q and on that constant C prime E positive, such that if the entropy of F truncated at the level one half, integrated uh, in time between say one eight and one, 
uh, is less than eta naught, then f is going to be bounded by two, right? It's going to be bounded by two on a smaller time interval, say on one half one cross R3. So for time between one half and one and for all V. I mean, almost everywhere. Good. Uh, so how does that work? Well, I mean, this is a standard, uh, this is a standard uh, the Georgie uh, procedure uh, for parabolic equations. So you pick a sequence of times uh, which um, <clears throat> grow uh, from one fourth to one half. You pick a sequence of levels uh, which grow from one to two. Um, and um, um, then uh, you replace uh, you replace the um, uh, the entropy by this nonlinearity here, which, if you want, uh, is comparable to the entropy. Right. So you look at f k plus of t and v to be mu of f to the one over q minus kappa sub k to the one over q positive part. Um, and uh, out of this, you construct a quantity, uh, AK, which is the supremum of the integral of FK plus to the power Q dV for T between TK and 1, and the integral from TK to 1 of the grad V of FK plus in LQ norm in velocity. You raise that to the square and you integrate in T. Okay, so this is the quantity AK. Uh, which uh, on which you apply the, the Georgie uh, procedure. So you control this by using the uh, truncated entropy inequality, which is, which is characteristic of uh, suitable solutions. And uh, you can show that this AK satisfies an inequality of the form AK plus one controlled by some constants. There is some uh, something that grows exponentially fast, some lambda to the K. What is important is that you have AK to the beta, and here beta is larger than one. So provided that A naught is small enough, then uh, AK tends to zero as K tends plus to plus infinity. So you control this A naught by the truncated entropy, and you conclude by Fatou Lemma that since uh, AK tends to zero as K tends to plus infinity, this tells you exactly that F is going to be less than or equal to two uh, on that interval here, uh, I mean, corresponding to the level at which you truncate for k going to infinity here and uh, the interval that you obtain for k going to infinity there. Okay, very good. So that's the standard, um, standard uh, the Georgie argument, but in, uh, in the language of the uh, Landau equation. All right, so now um, this is not enough for partial regularity, and we're going to um, now uh, apply another argument, but of the same nature, but uh, now we have um, <clears throat> truncated and zoomed uh, on the values of F, on the set of values of F. That is, this is absolutely characteristic of the, the Georgie uh, method to look at the level sets of F. Now um, we're going to do some scaling on the function uh, on the uh, on the solution uh, to the Landau equation, and um, so here's how it works. So suppose that you have f a suitable solution to the Landau equation uh, on some interval zero one, say, and with an exponent q again close enough to two. Why? Right? I mean here um, here q has to be just between four thirds and two. So four thirds is higher than six five, six fifths. But okay, so um, all right, so but still less than two. Um, with this Q, define gamma to be five Q minus six over two Q minus two. And uh, what I'm saying is that um, uh, there exists um, um, parameter eta one, which depends on Q uh, and on the dissipation constants in the truncated uh, entropy inequality. And there exists a delta one, between zero and one, such that if the limb soup of uh, the integral of the LQ, uh, the LQ norm to the square of the grad V of F to the one over Q, where F is larger than epsilon to the minus gamma, 
which you integrate between uh, 1 minus epsilon to the gamma and 1, right, uh, which you multiply by epsilon to the gamma minus 3. So if you assume that this limb soup is less than eta 1, then f is going to be L infinity on the strip 1 minus delta 1, 1 cross R3. Now, um, if you have this proposition, proposition 3 and uh, Vitali type covering argument um, on the half line, uh, it's classical to deduce from that that if you look at the Hausdorff measure uh, 3 minus gamma over gamma dimensional Hausdorff measure of the set of singular times, it, this is going to be finite, okay? Uh, 3 minus gamma over gamma, this is equal to Q over 5Q minus 6, if you do the arithmetics here. And uh, the main theorem will follow by uh, translation, okay, because here I just, I have localized in a sub-interval, not a half-line, and uh, letting Q going to 2, right? So I remind you that Q cannot be equal to, to 2 because I've used this... Um, the Devilet uh, propagation of moments to remove the weight in the, um, in the Fisher information, the vanishing weight at infinity. So I've used a little bit of um, Q. So Q cannot be exactly equal to 2. But nevertheless, you can let Q go into 2, um, converge to Q, to 2. And um, uh, for Q equals 2, you see immediately that this is equal to 1 half. Again, so um, at the end of the day, um, I prove that the Hausdorff measure at any dimension less than one half of the singular set is finite. So that gives me uh, um, that gives me the um, uh, the Hausdorff dimension as announced. All right. So how does one uh, prove this? Well, first you do a scaling, right? Like in, like so. So you introduce f n of t n and v to be uh, epsilon n to the gamma, f of one plus epsilon to the gamma t minus one and epsilon v, epsilon n being two to the minus n. So the scaling here will give you a suitable solution to the lambda equation. This preserves the lambda equation. What's important, it gives you a suitable solution to the lambda equation with the same coercivity constant. That's the, the thing that is absolutely crucial in this business. You don't, you don't change, you don't touch. The, the constant C prime E. And, uh, okay, so then you define capital Fn uh, in terms of little Fn with the same nonlinearity mu that sort of uh, replaces the, um, um, the F log F by, by uh, the mean of R and R squared. Right, okay, so that's uh, not very important. But anyway, so this assumption to the effect that uh, this limb soup is less than eta one, tells you that there exists a capital N large enough such that this quantity here is going to be less than more than eta one, say eight eta one, okay? Good, so then with this, you use the Holder inequality and the Sobolev inequality as in the proof of proposition two, you isolate the term uh, grad V of Fn plus one in L2 in time Lq in V, which is of order eta one. And you show that if you look at xm, that is going to be the soup of the integral of f n plus m to the q for t between one half and one. Here, you don't shrink the interval. The, the interval is always uh, one half one. I mean, in, in terms of capital F. Then you show that this quantity here satisfies a um, recursion inequality of this form, right? xm plus one less than rho times the max of one and xm to the alpha plus the max of one and x m minus one to the alpha. You start from uh, initial conditions x naught and x one less than or equal to capital M. So capital M is going to be a large enough power of two. So the N is say the first N for which this is going to be less than eight e to one, okay. Uh, here, um, alpha is going to be Q over three, and rho is um, some constant depending on Q, eta one to the Q over two. Okay. 
whatever. Here Q is less than two, so the alpha is less than one, right? So this is the opposite of the traditional, the Georgi argument. So when you iterate this uh, inequality here, uh, there's an easy induction that tells you that at some point, um, all the XM are going to be below one, okay? All right, so, um, Okay, so X2M uh, is going to be less than or equal to the max of two rho, two rho to the one minus alpha to the M divided by one minus alpha M to the alpha to the M. Alpha is less than, uh, is less than one, so that converges to zero. So at the end of the day, you find that some, for some M naught, this is going to be small compared to one. And now, uh, with this M naught, you scale back uh, uh, to the original variables and you find that F capital N plus M naught plus three, if I remember, satisfy the assumption in proposition two. In other words, satisfies the fact that the uh, truncated entropy at the level one half on the time interval one eighth one uh, is less than eta naught. And then you find the an infinity bound which you need, which you want. Okay. Uh, well, that's it. All right. So, um, final remarks. Well, I mean, this is a, this is a, um, partial regularity results um, in the same style as uh, Le Ray theorem for Navier-Stokes, right? I mean, in the Le Ray paper for Navier-Stokes, you already find the fact. It's not written like this in his paper, but you already find the fact that a Hausdorff dimension of um, of uh, singular times for for the ray solution and Navier Stokes is the most one half. Um, well, in fact, the, the Davilet, if you look at the Davilet theorem, it puts the Landa equation the same uh, class as 3D Navier Stokes in terms of Lebesgue exponents, right? Except for this weight one plus v to the minus three, which could or be important or not. That I don't know. But anyway, so if you look at Navier Stokes. Le Ray theory tells you that the, the solution is L infinity in time with values in L2 in X with grad U, which is L2 in time in X. So here, if you look at Landau, uh, square root of F is L infinity in time with values in L2 in V, so that's conservation of mass. And the Davilet theorem tells you that the grad V of the square root F is L2 in time and velocity, except for this weight. Uh, all right. But if you, yeah, apart from the weight, this is very much in the same, the same numbers. These are very, very much the same exponents. So, you know, it's natural to ask whether you have partial regularity in T and V uh, in the same style as the Caffarelli con Nianberg. Well, why not? I don't know. But more generally, you could uh, ask yourself whether uh, you have conditional regularity, uh, I mean, in the style of the papers by Serin and all subsequent papers where you assume some local Lebesgue exponent above a certain critical threshold, and out of this, you deduce uh, regularity, okay? Um, so, I mean, um, in an, if you take P equals infinity, so if you, the, the serine criterion, if you copy it for square root of F, would be exactly this, so I don't know if this is true or not. Uh, this is only true for P equals infinity and K larger than five. So this is a paper by Silvestre in 2017. It's also resolved by Gualdani and Gillen in 2016. And there's uh, recently um, a result in that direction by my student, Emmanuel ben -Porat. Okay, thank you very much. I think Ranjan uh, has some question in the chat. I think he says, Uh, he's referring to the stability in the nonlinear case. Uh, just did you have any comments on it? Uh, Ranjun Duan asking on the chat. But I, I, wasn't it a, a question for Jean? Mm. Not for. Was not for ah, it was a question for Jan. I thought uh, that was the previous one. talk. Sorry. <laughs> ah, it's an old one. So, yeah, science, yeah. But I think someone one. else is typing some questions. Yeah, Samir is uh, typing. Samir is typing. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I, I didn't see, I, I thought that one was new. <laughs> I didn't just realize now. No, uh, well, <laughs> well, maybe there is some stability for yes. Yeah. yeah, Samir, uh, Samir uh, wrote there, yes? Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, so, um, 
Well, unfortunately not, because, um, uh, I mean, with this technique, hi, Samir. So with this technique, um, you know, this technique, somehow you truncate the velocity, you, you get rid of the weight, okay? If you, oh my God, uh, I did the wrong thing. So if you return, so where is that? So that's, I think, uh, here. You see, at this step, you remove uh you 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 replace the the weight in v as appears in the in the devilet inequality uh you trade that for uh le bag uh le bag exponents slightly less than two uh for some gradient of f to the one over q okay with q slightly less than two than two so here i mean if you change the if you change uh the the potential what will change is this weight typically right but this weight you throw it away by this procedure of the propagation of moment so i doubt that with this argument i mean prop i doubt that this argument you will see the difference between uh, between the potential that will be um uh, that will be less singular than Coulomb. Of course, that will be a very nice question. We know that uh, we know that uh, uh, if the exponent is larger than uh, minus two, I think no problem at all. You propagate regularity and all that. Exactly. I think I think there's uh, the answer by the that. But uh, mm -hmm. but it's not the same argument. This is a totally different argument, right? Mm -hmm. I think. Uh, so uh, so unfortunately, uh, these. Um, um, these uh, partial regularity techniques will not see the difference between uh, between um, uh, Coulomb and um, possibly nicer potentials. Right. So, uh, for instance, we don't know what happens between minus two and minus three. I mean, probably this is the same as Coulomb period.